Everybody said, yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for the way your presence has been with us. We're asking, Lord, you open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of your word in Jesus' name. Yeah. We ask that what we hear, your grace, your strength, your power, will enter into us with the word, will be obedient to the word in Jesus' name. Yeah. Strengthen us by your word. Amen. Enlighten us by the word. Amen. We pray, Lord, we'll walk as children of God in this narrow path that leads to glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight we're having a Bible study in John chapter 7. I was studying from verse 14 through to verse 31. John chapter 7, reading from verse 14. Please open your Bible with me. We're told in verse 14, Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. Jesus went into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knowest this man let us? Have you never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but he is that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it is it be of God, or whether I speak of myself. That's the introduction to the study we're having tonight. And as we look at verse 17, the first part of verse 17, here Jesus said, if any will do his will, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether I speak of myself or it be of God. Very important then to know the will of God and to be willing to do the will of God. If there are people that do not understand the word of God, it shows there's no willingness in them. If there are people that are ignorant of the revelation of the Lord, it means that there's no willingness in them from the words of Jesus Christ. He says, if any man, any man, whether you are high or low, if any man, whether you are educated or illiterate, if any man, whether you be in any religion before or in no religion at all, it says, if any man, whether you knew some scriptures before, before you came to the study or didn't know, it says, if any man, if anyone will do his will, what that means is, if there's a willingness within you, that you are coming not just to enlighten your head, not to stop your mind, but you really want to do the will of God. You, are, you want the revelation and you want the explanation. You want the, the expounding of the word of God so that you will know what to do, how to please God, how to walk in the way of God. It says you will not be denied. It says if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. He shall know of the revelation. He shall know of the teaching of the word of God. Think about that. Doing God's will. 
As you think about that, that's what all the angels of God in heaven are doing, doing God's will. That's what all the saints, the raptured saints, or the risen saints, or the people of God here on earth, or there up on high, that's what they're doing. In fact, as we think about it, the reason for our creation is to do the will of God. The reason for our existence here on earth is to do the will of God. Are we saved? Are we born again? Are we children of God? The reason for our salvation, the reason for our redemption is doing the will of God. You're not just saved in isolation. You cannot just say, I'm saved. And you know nothing of the will of God. You are saved so that you will do the will of God. Actually, the evidence and the mark of true conversion is doing the will of God. Show me a man, show me a woman, show me anyone, young or old. If he's not doing the will of God, he's not interested in doing the will of God. He's not leaning on doing the will of God. He's not walking in the direction of doing the will of God. There's no evidence of salvation there. There's no mark of salvation there. The evidence of the mark of true conversion is doing the will of God. As you think about God himself, he created us, he redeemed us, he saved us. His desire, his demand is that we do the will of God. God is not interested in those who just come to say they are worshipping and to say they are reading the word of God and to say they want to know about him and you do not have any desire to do his will. His demand, his desire is that we do his will. You think about our sanctification, our purification and the cleansing of our heart and the way he does that second work of grace what does he do that so that we will do the will of God more and more the reason for the inner cleansing that he gives us at our conversion it is so that we'll do the will of God and when he induces us the power from on high and he baptizes us in the Holy Ghost it is so that we'll know his will more and we'll do that will of God more there is the divine intention of revelation and the divine intention of teaching the, the doctrine of Christ is so that we'll know the will of God and do the will of God. And it's a necessary preparation and readiness for heaven doing the will of God. Look at that verse 17 again. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself, doing God's will, believing the divine revelation, living in the light of revealed truth, and walking in God's way when the whole world is in opposition against us. And uh, we are all alone wanting to please the Lord. That's been the will of God. And to such willing people, willing hearts, it reveals the truth. It tells us in uh, Hosea chapter 6. Hosea chapter 6, we're looking at verse 3. In Hosea chapter 6, verse 3, Hosea the prophet is telling us the same thing. It says, Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. You want to know the Lord. You want to hear the Lord. And you want to know His will so you can do His will. It says, Then shall we know if we follow on to know, to know the Lord. As you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll see that the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated steadfastness in doing God's will at a great cost. And he has left us an example. And the reason why he has saved us and he has granted us grace is so that we we'll look at the pattern of his life, the model of his life, and follow through as well. First Peter chapter 2 verse 21. First Peter chapter 2 verse 21 it says for even here unto were ye called because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that we shall follow that he shall follow his steps it's left us an example that we ought to follow his steps as we come to John chapter 7 tonight the topic of our study is the willingness to know and do God's will. The willingness to know and do God's will. And as we look at these verses of scripture, 
chapter 7 from verse 14 all through to verse 13 we divide to three parts number one obedient hearts that experience transforming truth obedient hearts that experience transforming truth point number two obstinate hearers exposed as thoughtless transgressors obstinate hearers exposed as thoughtless transgressors and point number three overcoming hindrances and expounding timeless truth overcoming hindrances and expounding timeless truth number one obedient hearts that experience transforming truth the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that he gives us is to transform our lives is to change our lives is to turn us from darkness to light is to turn us from unwillingness to willingness in doing the will of God and it is to make us walk in the direction that will lead to heaven is to change us is to transform us and is to also turn us around that will say the place I used to be are no more there the things I used to do I no more do them and the places I used to go I no more go there there must be a willingness to be obedient to the Word of God if it's going to receive us as his own children let's come back to chapter 7 and we're reading from verse 14 it says now in the midst of the feast Jesus went up into the temple and he taught and he taught what has he been teaching he teaches he taught them about repentance because he said I came not to come to call the self-righteous I came to call the sinners to repentance what did he teach them? He taught them to repent and believe the gospel and believe the good news. What did he teach them? He taught them that if your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees, you will in no wise get to the kingdom of God. What was he teaching them? He was teaching them that if they were hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. And as he taught them, look at verse 15. And the Jews mother saying, How knoweth this man let us have he never learnt? On the one hand, that statement seems to be correct because he had not gone to their school, he had not gone to their seminaries, he had not gone to the school of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin. But he had been taught in another school, the school of God himself, because he said, as my father taught me. And so you, can say, you cannot say he never learned because his father taught him. But he didn't know the father. He didn't understand that the father revealed the truth unto him. But in their own understanding, he knew these letters, he knew these words, and he knew the doctrine and the teaching, and yet he had never learned in their schools. That's why Jesus replied them in verse 16, and Jesus Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine. He says, My doctrine is not mine, but he is that sent me. And if Jesus Christ has saved me and Lord, if he would say that, My doctrine is not mine, but he is that sent me. If the King of kings and the Lord of lords, our Redeemer, our Savior, and the one who came from heaven to earth, if he would say, I'm not teaching what I want to teach. And I'm not having a personal doctrine, a better doctrine. My doctrine is not mine, but he is that sent me. He said, when I spoke about salvation, that's not mine, him that sent me. When I spoke about conversion, that's not my doctrine. He is the doctrine of him that sent me. And when I talk about righteousness and holiness, I'm not just saying what I want to say. It is the doctrine of him that sent me. If he would say that, what an example, what a model, what a pattern for you and for me and for all preachers of the word of God that we will be able to say anytime and about anything we teach my doctrine is not mine but he is that sent me it was then he gave this central truth in verse 17 he says if any man will do his will they might have been thinking some of them that this is so high it's so much above our tradition it's so much above the Old Testament covenant. It's so much above what we ever heard from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. How are we going to know?
know this. How are we going to understand this? He said, just have the willingness to be obedient. That's why it says, if any man will do his will, he will know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Then he goes on to say in verse 18, he that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. He that speaketh of himself this is my personal view, seeking his own glory. This is my opinion, is seeking his own glory. He that speaketh of himself, this is what I learned, this is what I dug out, this is what I discovered. Is speaking of himself, is seeking his own glory. And Jesus Christ said, I have not sought my own glory. I didn't come to seek my glory. He says, but he that seek, seeketh his glory, that sent him, the same is true and no unrighteousness in him. What an example Jesus has given us. What a pattern Jesus has given us. What a legacy the Lord Jesus Christ has left us. You know, from what we're reading, he was wholeheartedly committed to heaven's truth. He was in a corrupt world and yet was wholeheartedly committed to the whole truth revealed by God the Father. The people were hostile against him. The people had hatred in their heart against him. And yet, that will not detract from the truth of the word of God. He came to teach them because he was wholeheartedly committed to heaven's truth. There were a lot of gainsayers and opposers to the word of God that listened to him. And some of them confronted him. And they even said they didn't accept. But all the same, he stayed on that word of God because it was the word of the Father, the word of God himself, and he will not deviate from it. He sought and he pursued the only glory that we ought to pursue, that is, only God's glory. As he taught, the Jews marveled at his doctrine. Then he revealed that he taught only what the Father had taught him. And as the Father had taught him, and if you look at uh, Paul the Apostle, that's exactly what Paul the Apostle said. He had not received what he taught from man. He received it from God. We're looking at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians, ch Galatians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 10. Galatians 1 verse 10, he says, For do I now persuade men or God? Am I trying to convince men or trying to convince God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Christ uh, could have leaned to those Pharisees and to those Sadducees and to those members of the Sanhedrin because they were after him. They were hostile against him. They hated him and they persecuted him. But all the same, he kept to the word of God. There are many people today, once there's a little pressure, a little opposition, a little conflict, a little thing that the people of the world say or do against them, they drop the word of God. It means they don't really have experience, experience with the Lord. It means they don't really have commitment to follow the Lord with all their hearts. And it means that they have not even fulfilled that verse 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine that I'm speaking of God. Paul the apostle said he was not there to please man or to lean or to bend towards me. Look at verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. He said, I didn't get this, this one from any school. I didn't get this from the opinions of the elders of the land. He says in verse 12, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Isn't it wonderful for you to understand and also to know to commit yourself to that word that you got this from God. You have a personal conviction, salvation, a personal conviction that this is from God. Sanctification, a personal conviction that this is from God. The baptism in the Holy Ghost that this is from God. And everything you understand, everything you teach, everything you say you believe, everything you say you are practicing 
to know that I got this directly from God and then nobody will be able to sway you or dissuade you from that uh, conviction. I pray we'll be standing like that in Jesus' name. And let's come back. Let's come back to John. In John chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 14 again now. Uh, about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple. Think about that. Jesus went up into the temple. As you think about the people that went to the temple, like those Pharisees and those Sadducees and even the publicans and all those that went to the temple, they went to do different, different things. And you're asking yourself, as you come to the temple, as you come to the sanctuary of God, the house of God, what's your mind? What's your purpose? What's your goal? What have you come to do? In the case of Jesus, when he went into the temple, we're told, and he taught. And he taught. And he taught. Anytime he went to the temple, that's what he did. He went in the morning, he taught. He went in the evening, he taught. He went on the Sabbath day and he taught. He went on other days and he taught. Look at John chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 2. John chapter 8, we're looking at verse 2. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple. Early in the morning, he came into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down, and tell me what follows there. And he taught them, and he taught them. He didn't say, well, this is morning. We don't teach Bible in the morning. Of course we do. He didn't say, this is too early. We cannot be opening the Bible and teaching the word of God, expounding the word of God. Of course we do. It says early in the morning, he entered in temple, and the people came, and he taught them, and he taught them. We're coming to verse 20 of that chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 20. These words speak Jesus in the treasury. That's another part of the temple there As he taught in the temple As he taught in the temple What an example for you That anytime you get sight of the temple of God Of the house of God Of the sanctuary of God like this As you come in You are either learning or teaching you're either teaching or learning. You're opening the Bible to somebody or somebody is explaining the Bible unto you. Because that's what the temple of God is meant for. The temple of God is not meant for commercial things. It's not, it's not meant for marketing. It's not meant for people to have entertainment. It's not meant for personal or social amusement. We come to verse 28. Look at verse 28 of that same chapter 8. It says, Then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. Hold on, hold on. I do nothing of myself. You know, he said, follow me. Follow me. Way to follow his example. He said, the disciple is not above his master, neither his servant above his Lord. But it is enough that the servant will be as his master, and the disciple will be as his Lord. And here we're told about Jesus Christ, I do nothing of myself. Hold on, and sit back, and think about your life. Are there many things you do by yourself? No inspiration of the Holy Spirit? And no revelation of the heavenly Father, and there's no prompting of the Spirit of God, and there's no verse of Scripture you can refer to. You just do it. It's carnal. You just do it. It's ordinary. You just do it. It's traditional. You just do it. That's common. That's what everybody does. You just do it. The Lord Jesus Christ said, "I do nothing of myself." Look at this. But as my Father tell me. Tell me out loud, aloud. As my father has taught me, I speak these things. He said, as my father has taught me. And it wasn't, uh, of course, Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the sinless one, the perfect one, the spotless one. He cannot be sinful and he cannot be proud. He wasn't proud and he didn't say, I know all that can teach by myself. I've been with the Father from all eternity, and I came from heaven, I came to the earth. I don't need any teaching. I do know there are people, finite people, ignorant people, superficial people. You do know there are people, the people that are immature, and they say, I don't need any teacher. I don't need anyone to direct me. I don't need anyone to show me the word of God or the way of God. Whatever I discover by myself, that is what I will do. If I cannot 
to discover it by myself. I will not do it. Jesus Christ said, I do nothing of myself. But as my father has taught me, I speak these things. Look at verse 29. And he that sent me is with me. You understand that? He said, my father taught me. And then my father stays with me and is supervising, is looking at whether I will do what he has taught me, whether I will say what he has taught me, or whether I will deviate. He said, He that sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone, for I do. What's the next word there? For I do. Tell me out loud. Always those things that please him. I do always. I don't take vacation from. The will of God. I don't take vacation from obedience to the word of God. I don't say, well, I've been obeying my father all these uh, days, and I think I just want to take this one day off and just please myself. I just do whatever I want to do. He said, always I do those things that please him. And thank God, Bastachi, as he speak these words, many believed on him. Like you are believing on him tonight. And if you have believed already, you believe in a deeper way tonight in Jesus' name. Uh, let's come to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Uh, and we're reading from verse 54. Matthew chapter 13. Uh, we're reading from verse 54. In Matthew chapter 13 verse 54, it tells us here, it says, And when he was come into his own country, when he was come into some country, that is where he was raised up, we're told he taught them in their synagogues. He taught them in their synagogues. He came to some country in the place where he grew up uh, as a human being. And then we're told that he taught in the synagogue. There are people when they go to a familiar place, uh, uh, they don't speak the word of God. They go to their village, they won't speak the word of God. They go to the place where they have been raised up, they don't speak the word of God. Or they go to their place of work, they will not let people know that they belong to the Lord. I pray you'll not be ashamed of the Lord. And anywhere you go, everywhere you go, you'll declare the word of God in Jesus' name. And it says, it's so much that they were astonished and said, Whence has this man, this wisdom, and these mighty works? Whenever he spoke, he always spoke things that were witchy. Things that were spiritual, things that were heavenly, and things that were glorifying to God in the temple, in the synagogue, everywhere. The people knew that this came from God. They were surprised, they were astonished. Let's look at uh, chapter 22 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 22, and we're reading from verse 33. Matthew chapter 22, verse 33. Here is, uh, you know, the testimony we hear about him here again. And it says, And when the multitude had this, they were astonished at his doctrine. What they have never heard, they heard. They were astonished at his doctrine. The way of life he made open, they were astonished at his doctrine. The word that converts the soul, they were, at, at, they were surprised, astonished at his doctrine. And the word that enlightens the ignorant, they were surprised at his doctrine. We're coming to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Reading from verse 49. John chapter 12, verse 49. Here Jesus confirmed again that his doctrine was not his, but as the Father had taught him just that he taught the people. John chapter, tell me, verse what? 49. For I have not spoken of myself. Can, can you just, uh, as a Christian, as a believer, as a child of God, discipline yourself that for this whole day, I will not speak of myself. I need inspiration. I need revelation. I need the prompting of the Spirit of God. I need the Father to tell me that here is what to say, and this is when to say it, and this is who to say it to. So that we're not just talking, talking, talking every time. Many people, they, they, uh, they talk a lot, and they talk into it's like uh, empty air coming out. Something not significant, something not important, something we cannot attribute to the Father, we cannot attribute to the Lord Jesus. 
Jesus Christ or to his spirit. But here Jesus said, For I have not spoken of myself. Look at this. But the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment. What? Tell me. And what? Tell me. I shall speak. You see that? Jesus Christ said, I'm not in a hurry to just say something. I'm not in a hurry to just open my mouth. I'm not, just, I'm not in a hurry to just discuss anything. I'm not in a hurry to share anything. As the Father has said unto me, as the Father has taught me, as the Father has enlightened me, as the Father has pointed out to me, he says, that is what I say. What a challenge for the believer. What an encouragement for the believer. And what an encouragement for the ministers of God that we will say, I learned that from the Lord. I saw it from the world word of God. It, get, it got me into it and you dig deep into the word of God and say this is the word and there's no shadow of doubt in your heart that you're speaking the word of God. You're teaching the word of God. Look at verse 50 and I know and I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak therefore, you see that whatsoever I speak therefore I'm speaking to sinners. Whatever I speak therefore, I'm speaking to my father's disciples, the believers Whatever I speak, therefore, I'm speaking in evangelism. Whatever I speak, therefore, I'm speaking, teaching and discipling the people that have come to the Lord. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, I'm speaking to the inner circle of believers and disciples. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, I'm speaking to a woman. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, I'm speaking to a man. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, I'm speaking in the public, I'm speaking in the private, I'm speaking to one person, I'm speaking to a crowd. It says, whenever, what? Whatever, wherever, whatever I speak, therefore, as even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. I pray that will be your testimony. If I had not been before from tonight, it will be in Jesus' name. You see, that's the reason we need to pray in the word. Because if we just hear it, it goes into our head. It may not even reach and be stuck in our mind. But it goes in our spirit when we pray. It goes in our heart when we pray. And we say, this is the principle I'm going to have. And this is the way of life I'm going to follow. I'm not just to be just opening my mouth and just saying blah, blah, blah. Without the leading you know, of the Lord. Look at John chapter 14. And I'm reading here from verse 10. John chapter 14 and I'm reading from verse 10. It says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? It says, I hear his voice within. He lives in me. And I know he's prompting from within. He lives within me. He says, don't you know, believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. See him repeating that again. He wanted us to be to understand. He wanted us to be sure. And he wanted it to register in our hearts so that we ourselves would live in that way also. If you are born again, that's the beginning of your, you know, listening to God as your heavenly father. And he's saying, go this way or go that way or do this or do that. Because it's not like when you were still a non-believer and you just went anywhere and did anything you wanted to do. Now your life is under the control of the heavenly father and so he says uh, the father in verse, uh, in verse 10 the words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself but the father that dwells where? in me he doeth the works look at verse 24 in verse 24 he that loveth me he that loveth me not keepeth not my says and the word which he hear is not mine but the father's which sent me and when you understand that you understand then that when you hear the word of God it's not the word of man when you read the words of Jesus it's not just an ordinary word it's a word that came from heaven that came from the heart of the father and that word that came from the heart of the father you receive it as the word of God it will have power to transform your life 
it will happen to change your life and it will just be like a natural thing to you that now you are able to obey the word of God you are able to do the will of God because the word works inside you it was told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 13 for this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when you received the word of God, when you received the word of God, I received the word of God. I said I received the word of God. Look at this. Which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men. Not as the word of men. There are people that cannot make any difference. Okay, that's his opinion. That's his idea. That's what he teaches. That's what he believes. They say that. But you see, for these Thessalonian believers, it says you received the word of God. You received it of us. Yet, you didn't count it as the words of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. This is the word of God. What do you hold in your hand? What's in that Bible? The word of God. And then it says, which walketh effectually also in you that believe it will work in our hearts it will work in our lives it will work in our families it will transform our actions and transform everything we do in jesus name and let's come back to this john chapter 7 john chapter 7 it tells us in verse 18, He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. He said, if you abandon the word of God, if you abandon the word of the Father, and then you're speaking of yourself, my own opinion, my own idea, let me tell you my mind. If it says if you're doing that, you're seeking your own glory. But it says, but he that seeketh the glory of him that sent him, the same is true. And there's no righteousness in him. Why are we learning all this about the Lord Jesus Christ? John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 4. The reason why we're learning all this is so that as he has done, so we will do. Is Christ, we're Christians. Is the Son of God the Savior? We are the children of God who are saved by Him. It's the one who shed His blood so that our lives will be transformed. And if any man be in Christ, a new creature, all things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. As He glorified the Father, we want to glorify the Father. As He spoke the word of the Father, we want to speak the word of the Father. As He followed the Father without deviating, without interruption, we want to do the the same thing John chapter 17 verse 4 I have glorified thee on the earth that's what you need to do I've glorified thee on the earth that's the purpose for your creation the purpose for redemption the purpose for your salvation and the purpose for your being attached to the Lord I have glorified thee on the earth I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do and now O father glorify Thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And so, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, you want to do everything to the glory of God. And I pray that that will be a reality in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. In First Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Following the example of Jesus Christ, following the pattern, the model of Jesus Christ, it says in verse 31, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, or whatsoever ye do, or whatsoever ye do, do, tell me the next word, tell me out loud, do all to the glory of God. You need to ask yourself a question. Anytime you want to do something, don't just jump into something without thinking. The people that jump before they look, the people that act before they think, but you think and you say, this that I'm planning to do, will this be to the glory of God? Will this help somebody? 
will this lead somebody to Christ? Will this encourage somebody? Will this strengthen somebody? Will this make people to walk in the way that leads to heaven? Will this honor the Heavenly Father? Or is this just to please myself? You know, if you ask that question every time, uh, and you claim to be born again, you'll be doing the right thing. Because it says, whether therefore ye eat or drink, when you are alone, whether therefore ye eat or drink, whatsoever ye do, when you are with people, you are with a multitude, and those people don't know the will of God, they don't know the direction where God wants us to go, they just do whatever they want to do, and it's popular with them, and if you are not doing it with them, it's like, where are you coming from? It's like, uh, who are you? It's like, uh, why are you different? But you want to be different so that you will do the will of God, and you glorify God every time in your life in Jesus' name. And says, and whatsoever ye do, do all, do everything without exception to the glory of God. I pray that will be a reality in our lives. Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 3. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or being glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind of Christ every time. The love of Christ every time. The purpose of Christ every time. The pattern of Christ every time. Let this might be you which was also in Christ Jesus. Psalm 119. In Psalm 119, I'm reading some verses here. Look at verse 2. Psalm 119 verse 2. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. Seek him with the whole heart. I'm reading from verse 10. In verse 10, with my whole heart have I sought thee. That is, you are not following God partially. You're not following God part of the time. You're not glorifying God part of the time. All the time, as a saved soul, as a sanctified believer, with my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Look at verse 34. In verse 34, give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. There's no reservation. There's no interruption. All the time uh, you want to do the will of God. Say verse 69. In verse 69, the proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts how? With my whole heart. Verse 145. In Psalm 145, uh, so, so one, uh, Psalm 119, verse 145. I cried with my whole heart, Hear me, O Lord, I will keep thy statutes. Before this can happen, that will follow after the Lord Jesus Christ, must have a heart like his, a new heart like his. After we are saved, we go back to the Lord, and he gives us this circumcised heart, and this heart of flesh, that will help us to be in the will of God, at the center of the will of God every time. Jeremiah chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 24, reading from verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 7. And I will give them an heart to know me. He'll do it for you. That I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their, with their whole heart. And when that happens, we'll be able to live like Jesus lived, we'll be able to teach like Jesus taught, we'll be able to do the will of God like Jesus did the will of God. Let's come back to John chapter 7. We're looking at point number 2 now. The obstinate hearers exposed as thoughtless, thoughtless uh, transgressors. We're looking at uh, chapter 7 of John. I'm reading from verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law? 
yet none of you keepest the law. Why go ye about to kill me? Think about that. These were people going to the temple. These were people carrying their Old Testament scriptures. These were people making sacrifices. These were people saying they were worshipping God. And yet it says, why do you go about to kill me? Look at verse 20. And the people answered and said, thou hast a devil who goes about to kill thee. Now as you think about the way they spoke to Jesus, number one, they were hypocritical liars and they were dishonest people. Actually, if you look at the scriptures, everybody knew in the land they were going about to kill him. And when he said, now you go about to kill me and you say you go to synagogue and you say you go to temple and you say that you are going to the sanctuary, you say you are worshipping God and yet you go about to kill me. Is it true they went about to kill him? Look at chapter 5 and I'm reading from verse 18. Chapter 5 verse 18. It says, therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him. That's true. They sought to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said that, that, that God was his father, making himself equal with God. It was true they went about to kill him, and yet now, look at their dishonesty. And look at their hypocrisy. And they said, who goeth about to kill you? Look at that chapter 7 again. Chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 25. Chapter 7, verse 25. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Even the people said, Is he not the person they are planning to kill? And they're seeking to kill, and they're making all the, all the efforts to kill, and they're speaking boldly, and yet they're saying, Who goes about to kill you? You have a devil. They were liars. I pray you'll not be a liar like them. I said you'll not be liars like them. Look at chapter 8, chapter 8, verse 37. Chapter 8, verse 37. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. You know, it's all over there in John. Everybody knew, and he told them openly, you go about to kill me. Look at verse 40. In verse 40 it says, but now ye seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. And so we know that these people were hypocritical liars. They were not willing to confess. They were not willing to forsake the evil way. And their sin and their plot and their plan to want to kill Jesus. Let's come back to chapter 7. Chapter 7. That's why we call these people obstinate hearers. They were obstinate. They were hardened. They were adamant. They were inflexible. That means uh, uh, they wanted to do evil and no preaching, no message could turn them or change them or make them to repent or make them to seek the Lord. They were sinners hard at heart. They were sinners that were adamant in wanting to perish. They were sinners that were inflexible, unrepentant. These were sinners that were deaf to reasoning. The Lord Jesus Christ reasoned with them. Why don't you repent? Why don't you seek the face of God? Why don't you go in the way, in the direction of heaven? But no, they were dead to reasoning. They were deliberate and they were sinners against their own good. Eventually, they were damned and they were forever lost. And let's come to chapter 7. And I'm reading here from verse 20. Chapter 7, verse 20, the people answered and said, Thou hast a devil. See them talking to Jesus Christ like this, the great miracle worker. Even if they didn't know that he was a savior yet, he is the creator and this is the light of the whole universe. He said, I'm the light of the world. And see the way they spoke to him. They said, Thou hast a devil. And look at chapter 8, verse 48. Chapter 8, verse 48. 
Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan, and tell me the rest. As a devil, the evil repeated it, and he said, We said, and we're saying it again, Thou hast a devil. Look at verse 52. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know. You see how they were talking with confidence and they were talking with conviction. Now we know. There's no shadow of doubt now. Now we know that thou tell me as the devil. They were talking to Jesus. That's what he bought. The shame he bought on your behalf. The insult he bore on your behalf. The blasphemy he bore on your behalf. They were hardened, blasphemous sinners. Actually, Jesus told them, look at their identity. Look at verse 44. Verse 44. Ye of your father, tell me. You know, it's actually the other way around. They belong to the devil. The devil controlled them. The devil directed them. The devil touched them. And the devil instigated them and inspired them, influenced them as to what they were doing. And yet, these people that were possessed with the devil, they were not turning to Jesus as a devil. That's how sinners behave. That's how backsliders behave. They turn around, and the evil people they are, they level on other people verse 40 for ye of your father the devil and the loss of your father ye will do he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaketh a lie he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of each they were of the devil I pray you will not be of the devil I will not be of the devil I said I will not be of the devil. In my thoughts, I will not be of the devil. In my character, I will not be of the devil. In my habit, I will not be of the devil. I will follow Jesus all the way. I will follow Jesus all the way. And we're coming, we're coming to chapter 10. Look at them. They, they, they have not stopped. They have not stopped. Chapter 10 of John. I'm reading from verse 20. And many of them said, this is not just one isolated, deranged person. This is not one isolated, deranged, hardened sinner. Many of them, many of them said, he has a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? But well, thank God, look at verse 21. Others said, these are not the words of him that has a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? A devil cleanse the lepers? A devil stop the issue of blood of 12 years? A devil forgive a sinner? A devil tell that man that they hang from the roof? He said, rise up and then rose up and walk? A devil open the eyes of the person that was born blind? No, Jesus did not have a devil. They were the people that are the devil. They were the people demonized, possessed by demons. And those demons eventually led them to hell. I pray you'll be different. I'm different. You'll be different in Jesus' name. John chapter 7. John chapter 7. We're reading from verse 19 again. It says, did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keepeth the law. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keepers the law. They were holding the Bible in their hand, the Old Testament, and they carried it about everywhere. My Bible, my Bible, my covenant, my covenant with God. I'm a child of Abraham. I'm a son of Abraham. I'm a daughter of Abraham. And they said, the law, our law, the law of Moses. In fact, they said, we're the disciples of Moses. And Jesus said, why are you bragging? This empty bragging. This empty noise. Because Moses gave you the law and you are not obeying that law. Let's look at John chapter 5 verse 45. John chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 45. John chapter 5 verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses in whom ye trust. The Lord was telling them 
Moses knows your hypocrisy. He knows your emptiness. He knows, he knows your carnality. He knows your disobedience. He knows your hard-heartedness. Look at verse 46. For had he believed, had he believed Moses, he would have believed me. For he wrote of me. But if he believed not his writing, how shall ye believe my words? There were unbelievers, although they were carrying the words of Moses about. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7. And we're reading from verse 51. Acts, chapter 7, verse 51. Ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. These were Jews. These were religious people, disobedient to the word of God, unconverted. They were not saved, unrighteous unrepentant, stiff-necked, and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets had not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and the murderers. Look at this. Who received the law by the dispensation of angels. Tell me the rest. Say that again. And I'm not kept it. Can the Holy Spirit say that same thing about you? You come to the Bible, so it is good. But the things you hear about conversion, about a change of life, about transformation of life, about not being of the world and not doing the things the worldly people are doing. Are you just hearing or are you obedient to that word? Is there a transformation in your life? Is there a change in your life? Is there the life of the Christian that will say that he has said the word of God? You can see the evidence is hearing the word of God because the life that he lives is a changed life, a gracious life, a righteous life, a sanctified life because of the word is hearing. But you know, if you are not like that, if you are just hearing and hearing, and there is no change in your life from week to week, from month to month, and from day to day, from year to year, you'll be like these people that you said about them who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Can your wife tell of the conversion, your conversion? Can your husband tell of your conversion? Can your children tell of the change that came upon you? How daddy has not totally changed since Christ came into his life. Can your daughters tell what change came on you as a mother? Or is your, mo is your uh, daughter or son whispering inside saying, uh, Mommy always goes to church. Daddy always goes to church. And reads this and marks the Bible. Marks the Bible. And yet there's no change. I pray there will be change. I said there will be change. In, uh, in John chapter 12. John chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 37. John chapter 12. We're reading from verse 37. It says in verse 37, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. They didn't lack evidence. The evidence was there. The evidence was there that he had done so many miracles before them, and yet they will not believe. I pray you will not be like that. John chapter 7. John chapter 7. We're reading from verse 24. John chapter 7. Verse 24. Judge not according to appearance. Judge not superficially. Judge not on the surface. Judge not by tradition. Judge not by what you have always thought. What you have always heard. Judge not by appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Judge righteous judgment. In Psalm 58, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 58, verses 1 and 2. Do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do ye judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? They were judging the message of Christ. 
they were judging and evaluating all the things he said and he told them it came from the father and he should have been able to tell because it was the pure word of God the transforming word of God the enlightening word of God it was different from what the religious people were saying but they were not judging righteously they were not judging uprightly Proverbs chapter 17 we're reading from verse 15 Proverbs 17 verse 15 Proverbs chapter tell me and verse what 15 he that justifies the wicked and he that condemneth the just even they both are abomination to the Lord they were condemning the Lord Jesus Christ and he was the just one the righteous one the upright one. He was the one that asked them, which of you convinces me of sin? There was no sin in his life and yet it says they condemned him. They even called him a devil and the Lord said they were abominations unto him. Going to church, abomination. Going to the temple, abomination unto the Lord because of the utterances of their mouth. Look at Ezekiel chapter 13. Ezekiel Chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 22. Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 22. In verse 22 it says, Because with lies have ye made the heart of the righteous sad. Jesus Christ was righteous. And they made him sad by saying you have a devil. They made him sad by saying you are mad. They made him sad because they said, we're following Moses, we're not following you. They made the heart of the righteous sad. Think about your life. Do your actions make the righteous unhappy? Make the righteous sorrowful? Make the sanctified people, the holy people of God unhappy because there's no evidence of change in your life. Does your action make your teacher and your pastor unhappy and sad because we teach and preach and pastor and shepherd so long and yet there's no evidence of real salvation it says because with lies have ye made the heart of the righteous sad whom I have not made sad now you are different from God if you do that because God says I've not made the righteous sad I've not made the righteous unhappy. I've not made my servants unhappy. And if you do that, then you are different from God. You are not serving God. Then it goes on to say, that's the verse 22, and strengthened the hands of the wicked. And strengthened the hands of the wicked. They condemned the just and they praised and appreciated the wicked that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. I pray our actions will be different. Our lives will be different. We'll do all things and say all things and act in all ways to bring glory to God in all things in Jesus' name. We'll come to point number three. Overcoming hindrances and expounding the timeless truth. Overcoming hindrances and expounding the timeless truth. We're coming to John chapter 7. And I'm reading now from verse 25. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly. But lo, he speaketh boldly. Tell me, but lo. Tell me out loud. He speaketh boldly. You see, there are people, they, they did not have the nature of Christ, the mind of Christ. Once there's a little pressure, a little fire, then they are timid. Then they are fearful. They cannot openly, boldly assert this is what they believe. If it's in their family that uh, the members of family do not believe in holiness and sanctification, they'll be hiding their holiness and sanctification. They cannot come forth straight and be bold about it. If it's in their place of work that the people believe that you have to, you know, take from Peter to, rob, uh, to give to Paul, or take from Paul to give to Peter, and they're changing this receipt and changing that receipt, they know it is wrong. They cannot 
come bold and say, no, this is wrong. Because they'll say, uh-huh, pastor, you have come. Pastor, this one is not church. This one is not deeper. You see, we must stand for righteousness. I pray you'll stand in Jesus' name. You see, there are people, they'll be wobbling and they will be kind of a compromising. But Jesus Christ, yes, they were about to kill him, but he knew that they could not touch his life. They cannot touch your life. Because he'll protect you. And he'll preserve your life. And until you finish what God has appointed for you to do on earth, nothing will happen to you in Jesus' name. Did you hear that? Amen. How weak. And it says in verse 26, uh, But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Because of his boldness, they believed. These people believed who he was. And they said, Do the rulers know that this is the very Christ? I pray that that spirit of boldness and the spirit of the conqueror will be upon your life in Jesus' name. When all the people are going the, right, the wrong direction, the boldness for you to say, no, that is wrong, God will give unto you. And then you'll back it up with your life. It will not just be an empty kind of boldness or authority. It will be a kind of boldness that is backed up by righteous life in Jesus' name. Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 28, we're reading from verse 1. Proverbs Chapter 28, verse 1. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but, 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 the righteous are bold as a lion. Can you think of, you know, a lion running away from a goat? Can you think of a lion running away from, you know, a little rat? If you are born again, you are righteous. And if they are not born again, they are goats and they are little, little rats. And it's unimaginable that you'll be running away from those people and you cannot take your stand in the market. Take your stand in your family. Take your stand among your friends. Or take your stand among your enemies and among your foes. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. I pray that spirit will come upon you. In fact, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, the people even testified about his boldness, forthrightness, and steadfastness. In Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, we're reading from verse 16. Matthew chapter 22, verse 16. And they sent out unto him the disciples of the Herodians, saying, Master, we know. We might pretend sometimes, but you know, we know. We might not say this with other people, but we know. They said, Master, we know that thou art true. I pray they'll say that about you. And teach us the way of God in truth. They knew, they knew. Now they came out, but they had a different purpose. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of man. That same boldness God has given you. If you are born again, I said he has given you. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 and verse 8. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 verse 8. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. For God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The Lord confirm it in Jesus' name. And let's come back to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. And here we're reading now from verse 27. They said, How be it we know this man whence he is? But when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Look at their ignorance. They said, We know where he came from. We know he was born in Bethlehem. We knew he grew, we know he grew up in Nazareth. But when Christ cometh, nobody will know where he came from. That's not true. Micah chapter 5 we should know where he came from 
and we should know that he came to fulfill prophecy and the prophecy of the word of God had told us very clearly where Christ will come from Micah chapter 5 verse 2 but thou Bethlehem Ephrata thou though thou be little among the thousands of Judah yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from old from everlasting look at Matthew we should know where he came from what were they saying and when Christ cometh we will not know where he came from and so because we know where he has come from you see the Christ of course is the Christ we know where he came from he was born in Bethlehem Matthew chapter 2 Matthew chapter 2 and here we're reading from verse 1 now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. We should know where he came from. We should know. Because he says now, Herod demanded of them where he came from, and they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet it had been prophesied and so those people that said when christ cometh will not know where he came from they were ignorant i pray you'll not be ignorant it says written by the prophet verse 6 and thou bethlehem in the land of judah at not the least among the princes of judah for out of thee shall come a governor capital g a governor that shall rule my people israel and so Jesus Christ came from there and they knew but Jesus Christ affirmed that he did only the will of God we're now reading from John chapter 7 John chapter 7 verse 28 then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught he kept on teaching saying ye both know me and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. Verse 29, but I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him. Tell me. Tell me out loud. No man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. Nobody can terminate your life before your hour comes. Nobody can stop your journey before your hour comes. And nobody can hurt you before your hour comes. The Lord is watching over you. Your life is sealed with Christ in God. Nothing will touch your life. Nothing will hold you back. Once you are in the center of the will of God, He will perfect everything concerning you in Jesus' name. Uh, look at what the Lord has said concerning people who stay at the center of the will of God. And you will know that once you are in the center of the will of God, no evil will happen to you in Jesus' name. Make it personal. No evil shall happen to me in Jesus' name. Psalm 91 verse 1 He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High Don't go out from there Abide, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty I will say of the Lord is my refuge and my fortress My God and in Him will I trust Surely, somebody shout surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler And from the noisome pestilence he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wing shall thou trust his truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night 
nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh at in the in darkness, and nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Are you ready for this? A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come near thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. At night there shall no evil befall you. During the day there shall no evil befall, befall you. In your place of work there shall no evil befall you. Neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling. For he shall give a sigil's charge over thee. To keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands. Lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. The young lion and the dragon shall thou trample under your feet. Because he has set his love upon me. Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high. Somebody there is going up higher. Because he has known my name, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Verse 16, I'll read it for myself. With long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. Christ was protected. His hour was not yet come. Look at verse 31. John chapter 7 verse 31. And many of the people believed on him. I believe. I said I believe. You believe your sins are forgiven. You believe you are saved. You believe you have eternal life. You believe you receive the mercy of God. You believe and no evil hand will touch you. You believe and will pass a spirit is mind into you. You believe you'll be courageous for righteousness. And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man has done? I believe today. I said I believe the Lord today. Rise up and tell the Lord, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Whatever the others are saying, whatever the others are doing, Lord, I believe. You tell the Lord, tell the Lord, and the strength of faith will quicken you and make you very different from all the people around. Believe, He'll forgive. Believe, He'll say, believe, he'll strengthen, believe, he'll sanctify, believe, he'll fill you with the Holy Ghost, believe, and nothing will cut short your life. Your hour, before your hour comes, you'll keep on serving the Lord with confidence and courage.